Thank you, Dr. Shashank, for a very kind introduction. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, my friends, Dr. Arvin, Dr. Bansi, Manoj, and team of uh, Diabetes India for this great opportunity and the great honor. And I am truly humbled to be bestowed upon the Siddhartha Memorial Oration. I think uh, we all have, uh, you know, seen uh, the stalwart in our lifetime. And uh, Dr. Siddharth Shah was uh, one of the, uh, I think, uh, towering figures in the profession of medicine. And he has inspired a lot of us. And I am one of those blessed ones. On that note, I'll start with the, my oration. The topic is obesity, a non, new non-glycemic standard uh, in the type 2 diabetes management. Uh, there are no financial disclosures here. So, uh, we all know that uh, diabetes is, uh, you know, characterized by hyperglycemia. And uh, right from the time that we have started understanding managing diabetes, we have been treating hyperglycemia. So, hyperglycemia has been the hallmark of managing diabetes. But what I am going to talk today is something different, which is emerging as another standard, which is to be taken care as part of management of diabetes. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about obesity as a disease, how to obesity and diabetes are linked, and how does obesity drive type 2 diabetes. Then what is the benefit of, you know, managing obesity in diabetes, and what are the guidelines? So let's see how does obesity, you know, lead to uh, how obesity and diabetes are linked. So obesity basically is, you know, looked up as increased body weight but it is defined as abnormal excessive accumulation of fat in the body to an extent that it impairs health. So it is fat accumulation, it is not just body weight, and we are measuring body mass index and body weight, and usually these are surrogate measures which are looking at fat. But BMI by definition is a metric of bigness, the total amount of you know, weight, which is indirect measure of fat. So it is an imprecise term, and now, most of the organizations say that we should switch to a term called adiposity-based chronic disease to define obesity. And this was first suggested by AACE. And now, even the other organizations are taking it up because obesity is an imprecise term. It is defined by, on the basis of BMI cutoffs, does not convey the health risk associated with excessive fat, and is not an actionable term when it comes to proving health. So, uh, the new term is now ABCD, which is the adiposity-based chronic disease, and it explicitly defines obesity as a chronic disease. It alludes to the precise pathophysiological basis of the disease and also avoids the stigmata associated with obesity. Now, uh, recently the ESO also adopted uh, ABCD as a you know definition and gave this position statement, and most of the organizations across the globe are now saying that obesity should be defined as a frequent, serious, complex, relapsing, and chronic disease process, not just increase in body weight. And this is so because we now understand that underlying defect is the adiposity or excess fat accumulation. In a person who is genetically predisposed, you will see that there is increased you know, accumulation of fat. When this accumulation crosses a threshold, it becomes obesity. Once it is crossing a threshold, there is dysfunction which leads to insulin resistance, leading to pre-diabetes and diabetes and down the line complications and also leading to increased metabolic risk. So the whole story is coming from a dysfunctional fat. Is there an epidemiological link? Yes, we have enough data to show that there is a strong correlation between type 2 diabetes and obesity and number of diseases have shown that. To the extent there is frequent concurrence of two, and it is defined as diversity. For every one kilogram increase in body weight, there is 4.5% increase in the risk of developing diabetes. Whenever we look at an obese individual, all we are reminded of is a number of comorbidities and complications that are associated with obesity. And especially there is increased risk of developing diabetes in cardiovascular disease. Obesity is considered as mother of all diseases of adult life, but it is the strongest association is seen with type 2 diabetes. And we know from 
you know, age old studies now that it is the risk of diabetes that is most important to be seen as associated with uh, obesity. As the BMI starts going up, so does the risk of obesity, uh, diabetes starts going up. And the population studies have clearly shown as there is rise in BMI of a population, there is a parallel increase in the develop, uh, prevalence of obest, uh, diabetes. And this was the data shown from Paul Zimet group in Australia that as there was increase in BMI, cross population, across population, there was increased prevalence of uh, diabetes. This is 20 years data across uh, North America. If you see from left to right, there is increased prevalence of obesity in US adults, and this is paralleled by rise in the prevalence of obesity. This is the, you know, graphs of uh, North America, 2004, look at the parallel prevalence of obesity and diabetes and how increased in last 20 years. So there is parallel increase in two. Obesity is a key driver for developing type 2 diabetes. And we have data from now India also, the ICMR in study looked at prevalence of diabetes across all states in India and this shows the prevalence of obesity in four major states, Chandigarh, Sikkim, Punjab and Delhi. Same states had high prevalence of abdominal obesity and the highest prevalence of diabetes also. So there is a co strong correlation between two conditions. Now, how does obesity lead to this, this metabolic state or development of uh, diabetes? So first thing is we have to understand how fat is stored in body. There is excess energy storage Whenever there is excess energy, it is stored as triglycerides in the adipose tissue. Now, the adipose tissue can do this either by increasing the number of cells or by increasing the size of cells. So, once there is excess storage of lipid inside the cell, there is increased stress within the cell and the cell becomes dysfunctional and this leads to development of multiple factors ultimately leading to insulin resistance, inflammation and increased risk of atherosclerosis. There can be a state when there is increase in number of cells without increasing the size and this, this cell does not become dysfunctional and remains you know, healthy. So you can have obesity without compromise on health and this is called a metabolically healthy obese state. But it is usually in transition and ultimately it goes to develop onto uh, you know, uh, unhealthy obesity. Now, how does obesity linked with insulin resistance. There are three key mechanisms which are proposed to link obesity with development of insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction. One is the increased production of adipocytokines from the adipose tissue. Second is the ectopic deposition of fat, especially in liver, muscle and pancreas. And third is of course the mitochondrial dysfunction. And mitochondrial dysfunction actually could be the key denominator this could be one of the important underlying defects which on one side leads to insulin resistance and other side also leads to development of beta cell dysfunction. So there is a possibility that there the underlying mechanisms which are there in obesity are also same, the same mechanisms are driving the development of insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction. So what happens is once there is excess overnutrition, these cells in the body are exposed to surplus, uh, you know, calories, the excessive nutrient components more than their requirement. And this leads to the deleterious effects on cell. There is increased, uh, you know, inflammation. There is increased endoplasmic reticular, reticular stress. There is increased production of free radicals and cascade reactions leading to development of, you know, uh, pro-inflammatory, pro-coagulant state, insulin resistance and development of uh, pre-diabetes, finally going to obesity, diabetes and complications. So, in nutshell, once there is, you know, uh, excessive accumulation of fat in an individual who is predisposed to develop obesity and diabetes, there is development of, you know, beta cell dysfunction and insulin resistance, which goes on to development of pre-disease state, which is pre-diabetes, pre-hypertension, metabolic syndrome and so on, and ultimately goes on to development of cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension, diabetes and NASH, and leading to the complications or the end organ damage, leading to uh, cardiovascular events, chronic kidney disease and so on. 
if you intervene at the level of obesity, possibly you will be able to take care of all these things. You will not have insulin resistance, beta cell dysfunction, and down the line, no, you will be taking care not only the disease, but also the pre-disease. Okay. So, focusing on obesity appears to be a very important component in management of diabetes now. So, let us see what is the evidence in terms of, can I have water please? So let's see what is the evidence of benefit in terms of treating obesity to take care of diabetes. Now we know that if you lose, you know, 5 to 10 percent of body weight, there is improvement in the risk of diabetes, risk of cardiovascular disease, the, uh, the dyslipidemia, hypertension, everything improves. And now we have data coming from, you know, trials like direct, where lifestyle interventions and caloric restriction led to 15% reduction in weight, and if you achieved 15% weight reduction, it was associated with 86% remission of diabetes. And we have two years follow-up from, you know, the direct trial, which involved caloric restriction to induce remission of diabetes and weight loss, showed that two years follow-up, more than 10% reduction in weight was associated with 64% remission of diabetes. And now we have also studies coming with the newer GLP-1 analogs and the GIP-GLP-1 combination therapies, which looked at reduction of A1C primarily, but also the weight reduction. And there is very good data showing that if you are achieving weight reduction in the range of 10 to 15 percent, you are achieving actually very significant reduction in diabetes and uh, very significant improvement in the uh, metabolic state and the benefits going beyond glucose control. Uh, so this is the step trial which looked at use of semaglutide in weight reduction and showed that you can achieve even uh, weight reduction going more than 15% in almost 80% uh, of the people, oh, sorry, 50% of people, more than 15%, more than 10% in 70% of the people. And in these people, if you are able, able to achieve A1C weight reduction of more than 10%, you are achieving a A1C reduction in the two, range of 2 to 2.2%. And this is the data from the surpassed studies which were done with the GLP-1, GIP combination, terzibatide, again showing that if you are achieving a good glycemic control and parallel A1 uh, blood pressure uh, weight reduction, you are achieving benefits going beyond glycemic control. And now we have these trials looking at erzipatide for weight reduction in people without diabetes. And we have data with, from Surmount already there. And it shows that in people with diabetes, you can actually look at, without diabetes also, you can look at weight reduction going to 20% or so. So we have now molecules which can help us reducing weight significantly. We also know from the bariatric surgery follow-up data that if you have a sustained weight loss going more than 10 years, you still have 35% or 37% remission of diabetes with good weight reduction. And not only that, there is significant reduction in the risk of complications of diabetes if you are, you know, having bariatric surgery done early in the course of disease. This is a very recent study which not only looked at the end, uh, results of bariatric surgery, it showed that post-bariatric surgery, there was improvement in neuropathy, which is not documented earlier. And there was stabilization of cardiac autonomic neuropathy, there was stabilization of retinopathy, and there was some improvement, um, uh, you know, improvement on the parameters of neuropathy. So weight reduction is changing somehow the whole trajectory of diabetes management. Now, this was a very recent paper which said that obesity management as a primary treatment goal for type 2 diabetes should be dis start, dis start getting into discussion and should be considered. And the reason is that obesity is now recognized as a disease that is associated with serious morbidity and increased mortality. One of the main metabolic complications is diabetes as the two conditions share key pathophysiological mechanisms. 
Weight loss is known to reverse underlying metabolic abnormalities of type 2 diabetes and such improve the glycemic control. Loss of 15% or more body weight can have a disease-modifying effect, which is not seen with any other anti-diabetic agents and the outcomes that is not attainable by any other agent. Furthermore, weight loss in this population exerts benefit that extend beyond glycemic control to improve risk factors uh, for the cardiovascular disease and reduce the risk of mortality. So let us see what the guidelines say. Now we know that guidelines traditionally focused on reduction of glycemia. This is 2015 ADA ESD consensus statement which gave the, you know, which, which focused on personalized diabetes care to begin with but said that once you have people with diabetes, uncontrolled hyperglycemia is to be addressed with lifestyle intervention and metformin, up titrate to two drugs, three drugs, four drugs, no other mention of anything else. It is only in 2018 that outside glycemic control, the considerations in included the addressing cardiovascular risk factors and the presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease because we already had data from trials like Empareg and Declare. And this continued in 2021 also, but 2019. And now we have the guidelines which were released last year, the ADA ESD consensus statement, which was presented at the ESD meeting in um, you know, Stockholm. And this uh, was also published on the same day. Now, one of the major changes that happened in this guideline that there was a greater focus on the weight goals uh, as essential component of care in people with type 2 diabetes. So, uh, the weight reduction was included as a targeted intervention and uh, has the guidelines state that weight reduction has mostly been seen as a strategy to improve glycemic management and reduce risk of weight-related complications. There, it was recently suggested that weight loss of 5 to 15 percent should be the primary target for managing people with type 2 diabetes. The higher magnitude of weight loss confers better outcomes and more than 10 to 15 percent weight loss can actually have disease modifying effect which is important consideration to keep in mind. Now the guidelines say that you have to you know focus on the have a patient-centric approach in the so two component, uh, you know, core components are the uh, personal focus and the patient-centric management and prevention of complications and improving quality of life. Now there are four key components of management. If you look at the circle, the first is the glycemia management, second is the weight management, third is the uh, risk factor management, and fourth is the end organ damage control. And all these four components need to be addressed simultaneously. It is not that you address one component after the other, and I'm not going to details of all these things. So glycemic management, it says that you start with metformin lifestyle intervention and up titrate according to whatever requirement is. Second thing is the weight management goals, and these need to be individualized. You have to put in you know, uh, lifestyle interventions, as well as the medical management, and if required, surgery can be considered for weight management. You have to look at the risk factors, and of course, you have to look at atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and CKD as important components of management. So, this is the holistic management approach now which is recommended. You have to look at all these four components simultaneously in management of diabetes, and the story has now changed to that you have to look at weight management and glycemia management on one side, risk factor management and control of ASCVD and CKD on other side and all these need to go simultaneously. So ladies and gentlemen, weight management is or obesity is new non-glycemic standard. All time we have been talking glycemia. So now you have to focus on weight management as an integral component of managing type 2 diabetes. Thank you. Thank you very much.